I get uh, continue on and uh, get started with our next panel, which is is going to be on uh, manufacturing workforce. And uh, I'm going to introduce my friend John Vickers. Uh, he will be our moderator. He's the principal technologist with the Advanced Materials and Manufacturing in uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate, and he is also also working at the Marshall Space Flight Center as the Associate Director of Materials and Processes Laboratory. You know, John is a, a wonderful technologist, and one, I asked him one day, why do you get so many of your things funded? And he, he told me, he said, hey, I'm just selling what people are buying, and, uh, and he does a good <laughs> job with it. So John, I'm going to turn it over with you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it was little, I was a little worried what Chris was going to use to introduce me, so that was not too bad. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it, it, it's really my pleasure uh, to be here, um, and I'm humbled to moderate this panel with such uh, august participants on the panel. I think you'll hear that. It's going to uh, we're we're going to uh, run this maybe a little differently. We're going to give the pan each of the panelists. Uh, about five minutes each to give, to relate uh, their experience to the topic of uh, manufacturing workforce, and then we're just going to turn it over uh, to the audience uh, for questions. So be, please be uh, preparing your uh, questions. If not, I've got a couple of questions in my pocket as well. You know, um, <clears throat> I heard Ivanka Trump was going to be in town uh, to talk about uh, manufacturing workforce. I told all my friends, I said, hey, Ivanka Trump's going to be on my panel tomorrow, right? But sorry sorry if, you, if you guys made the same mistake. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, I probably knew a little better than that. Um, so um, I, I had just a couple of opening remarks myself. Um, I heard the topic is uh, uh, generations of workforce and manufacturing workforce. Uh, is um, I, I've been in the business 37 years this year. I know I look a lot younger than that. 37 years this year, and always really in the same discipline area. So, uh, manufacturing workforce uh, I think is critical uh, to the aerospace industry, but it's really critical to the country. And so, it's one of the top tier uh, areas um, that I have a lot of passion about. And so, I try to work in that area. Uh, outside of my day job as much as I can. You know, uh, Dale Thomas spoke and gave some opening remarks this morning, and, and he quoted Von Braun on that famous trip down to Montgomery. Uh, I, I had one of those quotes myself, so I think I'll go ahead and use that. And Von Braun said in that speech that he made um, uh, in, in Montgomery on that famous trip, he said, it's the university climate that brings the business, and opportunity goes where the best people go, and the best people go where good education goes. And so um, while, it's, while it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future, uh, that's a tremendous uh, prediction. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit of our past experiences, but we're also going to talk about the future. And so one of the questions that I have in my pocket is about uh, a recent report that says from the World Economic Forum that says 65% of the children that are entering first grade this year will have jobs that don't exist today. And how will we prepare them for those jobs? I think that's the essence of part of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, uh, Jennifer Bolin Masterson. And she is the director of Boeing operations for SLS at the Michoud Assembly Facility uh, in New Orleans. That's a critical job for us. Uh, today at NASA. She's had a long, illustrious career. She's got an outstanding bio. We're going to keep the bios really short today. But one of the things I picked from her bio, that in 2011, she joined the 787 uh, operation in Charleston and hired uh, 650 mechanics and trained most of them, or many of them. So she's got some special experience, I think, uh, to bring to the discussion today. So Jennifer. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, hear okay, you. great. How's everyone doing today? You know, I want to talk about our technicians, the manufacturing role. Those are the folks that are touching the product. They're the ones building it, taking the engineer's ideas and actually putting it on the vehicle. And I will tell you that right now, we are really having a difficult time filling 
those positions. And when you think about manufacturing, I think there's a major perception issue that we've got in the United States, and that is a lot of the manufacturing jobs have gone overseas. That's a perception. It's dirty work, the environment's not clean, it's mundane, it's tedious, it's a button pusher. When you go talk to folks out in the community, they're like, oh, I don't wanna be a technician because all I'm doing is pressing a button, I'm waiting for a machine to open up, I'm taking parts out. Um, it's really thoughtless. Um, there's not a lot of activity going on. It's low paying. And you know what, really robots can go do that work. And really the perception is completely off base. And when we talk about the core stage and the SLS and the Rhine and all the parts of this uh, Artemis, you know, our technicians are really what I call mini engineers. They're taking all the ideas that the engineers have said, hey, this is how you build it, and they go one step further. Besides just listening to them, uh, they've got to be very skilled. Uh, we talk about the technical side of things. They gotta be able to maneuver around drawings. They gotta understand the drawings. They gotta be able to take what's on that paper and actually do it on the vehicle. Our systems are complex when we talk about, for example, the engine section. Very complex piece of hardware and everything is extremely precise, very detailed oriented. You gotta pay attention to the details. And if you don't, mistakes happen. And those are kind of some of the characteristics that our technicians we need to have, that they need to have. You know, it is well paying. If you go look at uh, the industry, manufacturing jobs supports families, and they don't have to go get a second and third job. So the environment, it, uh, it's very clean. You go into a manufacturing facility, it's clean, it's air conditioned. Um, it's good working environments from a team atmosphere. We want our technicians thinking that continuous improvement day in and day out. Our technicians are the ones actually helping redefine tooling, redefine the processes, redefine how we build things. Um, they have to be able to communicate uh, their skills from a standpoint of working with engineers, uh, our materials management, uh, design guys, um, all of that stuff. They gotta be able to do more than just push a button. And then what we do with our technicians is we call their statement of work running the business. They've gotta learn how to make sure that day in and day out, everyone is safe, themselves and their team teammates. So they've gotta make sure that if we get into a position where, hey, it might not be the best way to do it, they have to be raising their hand and saying, hey, we, we need to do this differently from a safety. They're always looking at quality. They're looking at cost. They're looking at innovations. So technicians' roles are very different than in the past. And so how do we get more folks involved in, interested in being a technician? Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to our STEM programs. We have got to get into the community and say, STEM is a way of the future as we talk about uh, the generations of 2024, 2028. We've gotta start with STEM. We gotta start with uh, kids in first grade, second grade uh, to continue on. The other thing that we've gotta do is partner with our local community colleges. Not everyone is ready for a four-year degree and that's okay, but partnering with our community colleges and building a program that allows our uh, workforce, our pipeline, to get the skills that we need, because right now we don't have them, is extremely important. Down in New Orleans, we have partnered with Nunez College, and they've, uh, last fall was the first time they had the first aerospace manufacturing technician associates degree uh, implemented. Our game plan was actually to get about 26 folks into that program. We have over 50 the first year and we graduated eight with a certificate in the first year. Now what we're taking is those eight, bringing them on board as part-time while they continue to get their technical diploma and getting them experienced in how to build and then allowing us to interact with Nunez to say, hey, keep this part of the program, let's make some adjustments to that pro side of the program. And then we also need to partner with our local high schools. We've taken trades out of the programs and we're so focused on the four years, and we need the four years, but we also need to focus on those who cannot go to a four-year college. And so we need to go back and partner with those high schools so we can start developing these skills so that our generations coming up 
will have the skill sets that we need to continue to manufacture um, the products that we want to. Because if we're going to go to, when we go to the moon and go to Mars, we have to have a generation that can uh, work on the product. Okay, thank you very much. And Jennifer, you know, we, I know you know, uh, we also teach a class through our National Center for Advanced Manufacturing Operations at MSU in friction and stir welding. We've been doing that for 20 years, and that class is always full. It's full yep. up. <clears throat> thank you again. So our, 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 our next panelist is uh, Brian Dix from GV, GE Aviation. Uh, Brian joined GE in 1991 as a design engineer, and then after numerous roles in engineering, he became the operations leader of the ceramic matrix composite development facility in uh, Newark in 2007. Uh, today, he's a member of the Huntsville community. He is currently the site leader for the ceramic matrix composites raw material facility in Huntsville. And so, you want to talk about high tech? We're talking about high tech manufacturing. That's a brand new, high, very high tech facility. So, Brian. All right. Thank you, John. Good morning. Yeah, as the site leader of the facility here in Huntsville, um, it's been, you know, a pleasure as part of being with GE Aviation to work on the site selection. So thinking about, you know, why do we pick the communities that we want to build our factories in, you know, starting in Newark, Delaware is developing sort of a lean lab approach and then really looking at how does technologies expand and where is the right place to expand. And a lot of it is about communities and why do we pick the communities, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, I think it's really about you know, what's there as well as the workforce agility. And as part of the workforce agility is, you know, the community college system that really develops the programs that tie in with the workforce so that there's a pipeline of talent that the businesses can draw into. And certainly with ceramic matrix composites that, that GE has developed and is using on their engines, you know, this is a technology that didn't exist in production you know, 10 years ago was in R&D, 20 years ago, and frankly, when GE called me when I was working in a factory in New Hampshire and said, hey, we've got this CMC facility in Delaware, and they make these really cool, lightweight parts that we want to put in our jet engines, I didn't know we had a plant in Delaware and had never heard of CMC. <laughs> so really about adapting your career, you know, being agile in, you know, your education. You know, I had done a lot of composites research in college, um, but adapting that to the manufacturing of what it takes to make these components. And today we're delivering them at rates of about one shroud for a leap engine every five minutes. So getting a workforce that is able to do that and a technology that's able to deliver that is truly important. We also, as a business, look to partner with universities. So develop that technical pipeline that's going to work both the component design as well as the component manufacturing. So making sure we have the techniques that we can make the parts at rate, you know, to deliver them at quality that we need in the business. You know, that's also true in the fact that, you know, as we start to look at more and more advanced technologies, you know, our Alabama factory in Auburn is doing uh, 3D printing and additive. Here in Huntsville, we're doing the CMC manufacturing. Those are two key technologies for GE Aviation as we drive performance. You know, it's all about looking at what is the right um, development technologies from a digital, from an automation, and we really look at that as complementary to the workforce. You know, our intellect is important to drive the technology, and really some of these new enablers that are coming along are really just going to allow us to do more in the footprints we have and, and continue to advance the workforce. Thank you, Brian. Um, our, our, our next uh, panel member is Dr. Philip uh, Farrington. Phil uh, is with TriVector Services today. Um, he comes to TriVector after retiring from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, after 26 years as a professor of industrial and systems engineering and engineering um, management, an expert 
uh, in uh, manufacturing technology and manufacturing workforce. I happen to know today that he supports the Army Mantec Division, and they have an educational component to that to their work. Uh, he's the lead for the joint NASA Redstone Additive Manufacturing uh, IPT, which also has an education and workforce component, and he's leading a special task for us uh, with Auburn University that includes Huntsville High School, Calhoun Community College, UAH, uh, in the area of uh, workforce development for additive manufacturing. So he brings some special recent expertise to this discussion. Philip? Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. John, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, my career started out after um, graduating uh, with my master's degree. I started out as a manufacturing engineer and did that for three years and then moved on to got a little crazy and got a PhD and decided to come to Huntsville uh, as a manufacturing uh, faculty member uh, in industrial and systems engineering. And, but over the, as John has highlighted in my career, I've been involved in manufacturing related activities and a number of, of outreach activities related to STEM. Uh, and thinking about that um, and thinking about the issues relative to developing a manufacturing workforce, um, I believe a lot of it comes down to vision, creating a vision for the students and their parents uh, about what their career could look like. If you had asked me a um, long, long time ago uh, as a high school senior if I would be, uh, if I would become a professor, I would have told you you were crazy, that I was going to get my degree and get a job and, and stay away from education. Um, and thinking through the process, I'm, I'm also, one thing that I think helps uh, reflect my um, capabilities and, and background. I'm the father of five, all of whom have uh, are now out on their own with their own families. Four of them graduated from college of, and one of them did not by mutual agreement. Um, <laughs> and uh, in looking at that, the struggle with my wife has a, has a bachelor's degree, I have a PhD, highly educated parents, helping them through the, the wickets of understanding what it is they want to do, what they're good at, and what the future might hold. And I believe that the biggest thing that we can do for our kids is, is expose them to experiences that helps them see the range of activities that might be out there. Um, my uh, oldest son decided at 12 that he wanted to be an engineer. He wanted to go to UAH, and he ultimately did that and, and has a good career. But in reflection, he wished that he had thought more broadly. Uh, an exciting thing that uh, I'm involved with kind of parallel to the work that we're doing relative to Calhoun and UAH and high schools on additive manufacturing. There is a group that's organizing a, um, uh, planning to put forward a proposal for an advanced manufacturing center that seeks to do multiple things in the same facility. It seeks to provide the opportunity for high school kids to get training on uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, provides an opportunity for college uh, community college students to do the same type of, of training in the same facility and use that equipment or, or closely related equipment to do undergraduate instruction and research and graduate instruction and research. And the vision for this type of center is that we do workforce development, which we already know is a strong and, and pressing need, um, but also we provide an opportunity for them to see the totality of opportunities there. You get on the education highway and there are multiple exits off. One is possibly going to, into the workforce directly after high school with some technical training in high school. Another off-ramp is a two-year college degree. Another off-ramp is engineering degree. Uh, and finally, on to graduate education and research. And we're doing more uh, in the universities to try to do, uh, get students involved in research, but we also need to give them the opportunity to see multiple experiences. Uh, and so that's an exciting new opportunity that I think we have that Huntsville is well positioned for. Uh, studies indicate, I know the state has an initiative going on to try to get um, 50, is it 500,000 certificates? Uh, in the 50,000 certificates, people with certificates uh, on the order of about half a million people uh, in the next few years to meet the workforce demands in the area. And I know in, in Huntsville, the workforce demands are in excess of 7,000 uh, manufacturing jobs coming in in the next few years. Uh, and so we need to create that vision, that opportunity for that. One thing that I would also say at the four-year college level, we need <clears throat> in engineering, 
uh, over the course of my career, there were kids that made it through and kids that didn't make it through. The kids that didn't make it through might have the, the uh, capabilities to be a techn technician or high-level technician, and in some cases, to ask them go back to go back to a two-year technical program feels like you have given in and creates disappointment for them and for their parents. There should be another off-ramp, and that's a four-year technology program. And there, there are a few around, but they seem like they have dropped off in number. But we need to create another off-ramp uh, that allows them to go into manufacturing uh, without necessarily an engineering degree. And, and again, in a conversation two years ago with my oldest son, uh, we were having a, a conversation about this specific topic. Uh, my oldest son's comment was, you know, in hindsight, I probably would have been happy, happier than I am now if I'd been a machinist, which is a highly technical job. My son-in-law, now son-in-law, uh, said that in thinking about it, he said, I would have disappointed my parents if I had not gone after a four-year degree. And I think we need to create that vision, that understanding of what the opportunities are and what you can do with your life. Um, and most of us, I imagine if we did a poll in here, not many of us would have predicted that we're in the positions we're in today uh, when we were 18 and 20. We're putting a lot of pressure on an 18, 19 year old child to make, uh, make a decision about the whole future and it seems overwhelming. So they grasp at something and then later find out, hey, it's not really what I wanted. In fact, last story, and I'll, I'll stop, my youngest son, became an industrial engineer. I, yes, he did have prompting. Uh, and, uh, but he went to Auburn because he didn't want to take classes from me, um, <laughs> which I was a little disappointed about. Uh, but uh, he, his analysis seemed right to me. He's working on the arsenal now. He was a systems engineer. He decided in the, in the middle of it that the thing he liked to do the most was coding. Now, you could stick a... <laughs> stick me in the eye and if I have to code, but uh, he loves that. That's the best part of his day. So he transferred to a group to do coding. And in reflection, if we had known that earlier, his degree would have been different in terms of what he did. So anyway, that, my thoughts are we need to create a vision and opportunities for our kids to see the totality of opportunities in manufacturing and line them up accordingly. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I, I think raising uh, five children should prepare you for just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> so next, uh, our next panel member is one of my favorite people, uh, Dorothy Rasco. Uh, Dorothy's the Director of Engineering Operations and Facilities for Ball Aerospace, where she directs the development and execution of the strategic plan, uh, budget management for all current and long-term facility uh, operations. I, I knew Dorothy in a previous life where she served as the Deputy Associate Administrator uh, for, uh, space tech, for the Space Technology uh, Mission Directorate, and among other things, she was my boss. I hope I didn't cause you too much problems <laughs> while we were there, Dorothy. Let's see. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for everyone that's here. Um, I want to share with you some of the thoughts that we have on the challenges in manufacturing. Um, but first, I want to give a shout out. The top middle is James Webb, and it's where we at Ball Aerospace were instrumental in the advanced optical technology and the lightweight mirror system. And I think um, shortly um, it's coming together and we'll be launching it soon with uh, Northrop Grumman is the prime and we were one of the subs. So. The manufacturing challenges that I'm going to share with you was I, um, being over engineering operations and facilities at Ball Aerospace, I thought I walked through these facilities and I wanted to go and talk to the community, the people that are the touch labor. It's like what Jennifer said, it's the people that are having the hands-on, touching the um, spacecraft, the payload, building the different antennas and the different sensors that we uh, build. So anyway, when I talked to them, they said it came in three different uh, areas. The community and industri industry leaders must commit to make a difference. They must invest time and money in the manufacturing programs. I'm going to be giving you a little flavor coming out of Boulder, Colorado, and the Denver area where there's a lot of aerospace 
um, companies and we're all competing for a lot of the same manufacturing folks. Um, and so when I talk to our different uh, folks there, we realize for us to be competitive with the other uh, companies that are hiring manufacturing machinists, um, people that do soldering, the hands-on, we have to build relationships. So what we've done is we've reached out to the different trade schools and to the different community colleges. We have a presence there that we are there several days a week. We are helping build their curriculum that would be specific to help our areas. We are um, helping them with apprenticeships with the different um, folks. and. Building these relationships, it's about the people. Where do they feel comfortable working? Where does um, the culture fit what they believe in? How can they go into a um, position where they're respected as a machinist with the um, different disciplines? So at Ball Aerospace, you have your PhD scientists all the way down to your machinists, the people doing the soldering. It's so interesting because we design, develop the product, we manufacture it, we test it, and then in some cases, we go into production. Sometimes we're building one or two spacecraft or payloads, but sometimes we're building multi-unit antennas um, to support our customer. And so when you go into these different manufacturing, we have over 400,000 square feet of assembly uh, integration test with environmental test and with um, all of the different ground support equipment to provide the testing and the production of all of these different instruments. And the machinists and the technicians, they are like artists in their area. It's really hard to find someone that is really good in that area. So one of the things that we've done is we've made a conscious decision to go out and work with the different um, community colleges, with the state, with the local government, with the, um, also with the different elementary and high schools. One of the things that I feel as though that Boulder has done, which is kind of cool, is we have a place called the Maker Space. And what it is is, you know, kids that are in sports, they can go to the YMCA and they can um, play basketball or you can get on a soccer team. This is a playground for machinists. This is a place where people can collaborate, learn, and share experiences with each other. These young adults have a different interest in a teaming that's different for, from sports. Um, these are people that want to work with their hands. They want to build things, and they really believe in what um, they're doing. And having an environment like that for them to go and learn is one of the ways that we've engaged to try and bring in more uh, manufacturing into our organization. We also have um, sponsorships for the National Robotics League. And this last year, two of our teams actually went to the uh, Nationals. And when I've gone and mentored and uh, worked with some of these students, and there's this one area in Longmont where they have a whole machine shop and they have like 100 um, kids starting from fifth grade going to seniors in high school where they can learn how to do machine machining, they can do 3D printing, and um, they can get hands-on experience. So that's one, my first area where the community, we need to invest together. The other is changing the mindset around manufacturing careers, and it's like what Jennifer says. Um, I'm not going to repeat what she said, but we had a conversation before. It's changing the mindset that you can have a really excellent career, and you can make a lot of money and you can raise your family and you can enjoy what you're doing and you can be a part of, of all what the whole company's doing. So when I go and talk to the different folks and I show them like the James Webb, it was because of them that we were successful in that and, and making sure they're part of the team, they're part of the community at Ball Aerospace. And the last we had was we need to take advantage of the veteran resource pool. We need to improve the transition um, programs for them. What's happened is a lot of people come out and they're technicians or they're um, mechanics. And a lot of their trade, a lot of their experience, we can transition into supporting us on the manufacturing side. And so one of the things, um, one of the quotes that one of our ma uh, machinists said, and it's, I'm taking it from Amelia Earhart, is the most effective way to do it is to do it. This is how these people learn. This is how these people um, thrive in their, uh, in their career, is being able to work 
with other machinists, work with an apprentice, and work with uh, different people in their trades. And that's one of the things that we're doing to invest in our manufacturing to bring in the right talent. Thanks. Wow, this is pretty good. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. Ne our, our next uh, panel member is Charlie Stegemiller. Um, he is currently the Senior Director of Business Development at SAIC, uh, focused on bringing best practices from across the company uh, into the NASA mission. Prior to SAIC, he was a NASA civil servant for over 27 years, serving across the Space Shuttle, Space Station, NASA MIR, uh, and Advanced Human Performance Initiatives, with the last six years serving in the stand-up and deployment of the Constellation program. He likes to say, in fact, he was the last man standing. You know, sometimes I feel like that too, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you for the panelists. And now for something completely different. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about manufacturing touch labor. That's not one of the things that we do on a daily basis. But what I want to do is connect the dots. Um, this uh, manufacturing uh, careers and the challenge that we're faced with in the next five years of delivery for Artemis 2024 means that we've got to re-educate and retrain ourselves that are present today. The STEM is important. In fact, uh, I go back to the vision for space exploration with Bush 41, and January it came out, and Norm Augustine in 2004 testified to Congress, and I was at that uh, panel session, and he said, this country doesn't graduate enough engineers. And in fact, the gap is so significant. In 2016, at the end of 2016, China graduated 4.7 million STEM diploma personnel. India graduated 2.6 million. U.S. and Russia are about equivalent at 560,000. So we have to figure out how is it that we can leverage off the trades. You're talking about competitive workforce. We onshore more uh, economy. Uh, economy grows when we onshore more. We're seeing that. It creates a uh, tremendous uh, pressure and competition for assets within our, or within our own culture. And we need to figure out how are we going to manufacture differently. We're not going to go and grow a million more STEM graduates year over year in our present state. So can we change how we do our design and get towards development and delivery? So I'm about the people, processes, and tools. And what I witnessed in Constellation is we were trying to stand up a program that didn't have all the tools together for digital engineering. Well, today the COTS tools exist. And, and so when I talk about SAIC and what we're doing, I look up, lift up in a lid, and we help work on the DOD mo uh, initiative on digital engineering strategy that the, they issued out in 2016, 2018, and it's going digital. We've got team members that are working with NavAir and NavC. They're going completely paperless on the next generation of helicopters and tools and armaments. So the techniques on how we can go straight to design to manufacturing without having to touch paper causes us to rethink how we do our processes. And if we think about the number of different instruments they're going to have to put together each mission and subsequent missions for an Artemis lander, we've got to have an ability that we can go and roll dash numbers. So how do we apply, you know, t connect the dots? Well, this great news is most of us that have kids uh, in the late teens, early 20s, they are really technically oriented. Even if they don't have a degree, they can certainly uh, manipulate the, uh, the game box. <laughs> That's not far off from how do we leverage that competency knowing that we have too few hands to go and manufacture the product. So what I would encourage us as we think about, we have both the challenge today of how do we continue the pipeline of future engineers and STEM and science and, and the different trades, but at the same time, how do we reorient ourselves and, re and cast off some of the, the legacies that we had? I, I did paper. I was a Configuration engineer on Freedom back in the late 80s. And I worked on shuttle. I worked on NASA Mir. I worked on space station uh, ISS. I worked on Constellation. And the document structure needs to pass away. We need to go to models. We need to go to completely digital systems so that we can have a faster thought to outcome. Because the techniques that these manufacturing trades that you mentioned are all digital. They can go straight to the machine. We're doing the 3D printing. We're doing the buildups. How do we ex expedite and move that? So I'm encouraging you all to rethink how you today can change your business practices in your organizations today to help expedite that translation. Because we're not, I'm not, I'm not an advocate that we're going to see 2 million more engineers per year 
or technicians be generated. So we're going to have to rethink how we do our business and our manufacturing approaches so that we can leverage off the people that we do have and continue to grow them, but we can't just make them up. They have, it takes a while. So that's my encouragement is if you haven't become aware of the digital engineering strategy that's occurring across the military and the intelligence community and, community and, and what's happening within NASA, I encourage you to do so because I think that's how we're going to leverage off of each other. You know, we, we've got to grow more, but we have to get better at, at what we do today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Charlie. That was a great perspective. I, I just want to mention one thing before we go to the audience questions. If you look at the backdrop of the photo collage that we put together, uh, we asked our panel members to send in a photo that represented, you know, their feelings about the, their work and their experience and their feelings about the panel discussion that we were going to have today. So it's a little, it, it, it started off a little bit random. But if you just look at that, and those are, those represent such exciting careers in manufacturing to go into. I just can't imagine that uh, anybody wouldn't want to work in those areas. And how do we get that message out? I think that's critical for us to get that uh, message out and change a little bit of the perception that Jennifer talked about about uh, manufacturing work. So I think, Chris, we'll go to audience questions. You know, I put a whole list of 10 questions together, Chris, so we can spend all afternoon if you yeah. guys have the time. Well, let's be careful with that. Um, yeah, uh, so you raise your hand if you have a question uh, here. You can actually uh, ask a question in person if you're at AIAA. They make you type it in, don't they, Dan? Good morning. Frank Slazer with Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, one, one of the speakers, I think uh, Dr. Farrington, mentioned the fact that Parents, and I'll, I'll extemporize this, parents with, with college education backgrounds typically have students that are expected to go to school and typically raised up with that expectation. It's always the right mix, as you point out. Another category of students that I'd like to draw attention to is um, people of color and, and women who traditionally also have not gone into manufacturing careers. And, but, but I would think even more so you'd have that same sort of a thing where because they haven't had those types of careers in their family or in their gender, they're less likely to think of it as something that would apply to them. But if you look at the demographics of the American population, increasingly that's the generation of the future. So are, are we succeeding in getting more uh, people of color and women into uh, career technical education programs and manufacturing careers, or is that another area for additional focus? I'm going to, can I tell a story? Sure. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so at Ball Aerospace, there was um, this one young lady, and she's a machinist, and she works um, with the with the whole team of machinists. And she was actually the reason I knew about it. I went on a YouTube video, and she received an award. She was um, single mother, raising her children, two young children, one and three, by herself, and um, was living in a shelter and the people in the shelter helped her go to get a trade and the trade was to be a machinist. And when she graduated from that trade school, Ball hired her and the other team of machinists took her in under their wing and went out and with their own money bought her the toolbox, the toolkit that she would need um, and have mentored her into being one of the best. Now, she's a special case. Um, it's a great story if anyone wants to see the video because um, she won an award and she told her story that she would have never known to have had this kind of career being a single mom thinking that she would have to go to college but she needed money quickly and she had mentors that helped her. So I would say that at least in Colorado, we have several female um, manufacturing folks, and we have a, several, we're, we're pushing the number of female engineers. And um, Ball Aerospace this year from Forbes Magazine was given number one for diversity and inclusion. And so you have to make an effort to go out, and you have to make the people feel comfortable within their environment where they're working. And this is, that's just one story I wanted to share. We have a question over here. Good morning, Matt McSavany from Marshall Space Flight Center. 
what hurdles, oh, this question for Charlie, uh, what hurdles did DOD and the intelligence community have to overcome to adopt these MBSC tools? I don't think the hurdles are the issue. They realized that they needed to be a faster, faster foot to get the outcome. Uh, Dr. Griffin took over the, over, uh, Mike Griffin's over, overseeing the advancement for research and technology for the DOD, and they're just having to break down the barriers. The FAR process taking 12 to 15 years to get from an idea to a deployment was limiting our ability to protect our country. And so he said, I need to knock the barriers down. And part of those barriers, I, I need to get more digitally inclined. Take advantage of what's already present. And we, we generated this capability, but we don't fully utilize it. So by going digital and going, I'm talking to the program manager for the ISS about a zero paper project, that he, he wants to stop seeing paper. You have to be intentional about it because the tools exist. It's not like you're having to go and create a new machine language. It exists. It's just how do you transform where you've been to where you want to go. So the barriers are, so back to your point, though, the question is, it is cultural change, but it's processes. And because the COTS tools exist, it's training is simpler, but you have to, you have to direct the action. You have to be intentional about reaching out to underrepresented uh, demographics in this industry. Go to those schools and those communities and bring them into the game. It's the same thing. You have to direct action to have the outcome. I'm not sure if, I can't speak for all the hurdles in the DOD intelligence side, but those are some of them. Okay, John, we have a question right here. I didn't hear any of you mention VICA. Have any of you been involved in that and reaching out as part of your STEM activities? What's the acronym again? VICA, V-I-C-A, Vocational Industrial Clubs of America. Used to be really big in the high schools that, uh, you know, electronics would have a VICA and auto mechanics would have a VICA. And you'd get people coming out of there that were ideally suited to work as, you know, as, a, as assembler, you know, this type of work? Mm -hmm. Well, I can speak of, so I'm in the Houston Clear Lake area, and the, the Clear Creek Independent School District has several different, I don't know that I've heard the term VICA, but they, they have similar types of outcomes inside the, each of the high schools. And, um, you know, they have STEM programs from kindergarten through 12, and they're trying to link that pipeline. How do you make it? But, like, programs like Hunch is a NASA-sponsored initiative. Like, we've got several high schools in the uh, Houston area that are making flight bags and flight equipment and one high school actually built the, a, a production facility for plant growth chamber for the ISS that has flown. So there are lots of different layers of how do you pull it forward. I haven't heard the term VICA though. You know, it's, a, it's a national organization. Right. So. Yeah, here in Huntsville we're involved with the limestone community uh, in the school. So our teams are, you know, working with the students to get more engaged in those STEM programs. So it's important for for GE and GE Aviation to be in the community, be visible in the community, and really be here as a partner. So, yeah, we, we want to be very involved, you know, all the way through. Hi, Andrea Harrington, Air Command and Staff College. I'm wondering if the panel would be willing to talk a little bit about the effect of export controls on developing a manufacturing workforce for our industry, particularly in light of some of the challenges that were raised in graduating the relevant number of STEM graduates within the United States. Thank you. I, you wanted to give me all the questions, but that one's <laughs> Well, so um, at Ball Aerospace, because 70% of our work is DOD and intelligence, um, we just recently, uh, we are, we only have U.S. citizens in all of our facilities, and um, that's just the way it is, and that's how the security is set up. So all of, like... Today, I actually had some charts, and I didn't realize I had to go through ITAR and export control. But we learned really quickly <laughs> that um, I sent them to John on Monday, and then I withdrew them like an hour later, and then I sent them again, and then we all decided, oh, we don't need charts. And so, um, but anything that goes external out of ball aerospace, we go through export control. So I, I think that sounds like the topic of another session entirely. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I, I do know, so, so when new technologies uh, come along, like additive manufacturing that's becoming so uh, pervasive, 
it does, it, so it scares people a little bit. And so in the infancy of additive manufacturing, we did have some visits by three-letter agencies that were like, you know, we got to clamp this down and we've got to stop it. Well, you can't really, you can't stop it. So you have to figure out a way to work within the, you know, the laws, the constraints that we have. Hey, John, you said you had some prepared questions. You want to? Uh, so, uh, I see a question up here, but I'll be glad to. Okay. Uh, James Ebling, student here at the university. Um, I've worked with high schools on various projects. How do you keep them involved when there's so many other things going on in their lives? I think the key of that is to make it fun, right? Um, yeah, we put a lot of pressure on our high schoolers. I have actually a freshman and, you know, trying to figure out what that career path is, um, and it's all over the map. Um, but I think the key is to... They, when it's fun and it's not something that you're doing day in and day out, because that's not what they're about right now. They want to be able to dabble in this, dabble in that. I think that's what we've got to go continue to work on. Um, when you talk about like STEM programs, uh, you notice that a lot of it is younger. And how do you get the high schoolers more involved? I've now, instead of having my daughter participate at the STEM, she's actually helping volunteer at the STEMs. And so I think getting that volunteerism in place will also help assist um, getting them interested into the STEM or whatever they uh, might actually enjoy instead of saying, just like team sports, right? They have to do that six days a week. And at the end, some of them are really burned out of team sports from that standpoint because we put a lot of pressure on them. Let's not do that with our education. Let's do it maybe a month, uh, something here on a month or every other week, something like that I think is going to be key. A lot of the STEM initiatives that I'm familiar with are typically short-term activities, a month or two months, um, and there's a number of them around. A lot of, I think most colleges these days in uh, engineering and science have summer camps uh, that are a week or two long that allow students to get some experiences uh, related to that. We sponsor the, uh, the Science Fair Awards Program in Clear Creek ISD. It's about a 45,000 student school district. And when we do the awards, I'll, I often ask the kids how many of them like to do games. And all of them raise their hands. I said, well, look around. This is the hardest game you're going to play. Science requires a, what's the ground rules. There's a timeline. There's some conditions. And I invite them to bring their friends to come play. I think we make it a, too much about the individual, and I think it's a team sport in a lot of this case. So I think any way that you can look at how do you broaden the team, and I, another example is the Systems Go effort. It's out of, out of Texas, out of Fredericksburg. It's getting some national attention, but it's teams are working on uh, how to build a rocket to fly a payload to uh, 100 miles into space. And if they get to the level three, they fly out of the White Sands missile range, and they fly a payload but that takes all the different skills. And so the story works well, the small little, um, uh, really small little rural high school team, they've got the ag kids are the ones that ought to bend the metal, so they'll make the rocket. And the Brainiac kids that couldn't bend metal if they tried know all the calculus to do the, the trajectory analysis. And they collaborate in a multidiscipline team format to work together to an outcome because it takes all those different skills. Any way that we can gamify the, the advantage of learning and living in this environment is, is a benefit. I was involved. There's a program at UAH. Uh, the acronym is INSPIRES. It's basically a systems project that engages students in developing. It's modeled after the NASA's Discovery New Frontiers program. So uh, it involves high school students, and uh, college students. The high school students are developing a secondary payload to go on to a, a launch vehicle being designed by students at the University of Alabama at Huntsville's uh, mechanical and industrial engineering programs uh, that's going to fly to a planetary body uh, on a mission designed by students from the College of Charleston. Uh, and it's, it's part of, we engage with uh, typically high school science teachers and have their class do this as a class project where they're developing the payload and engages them in activities. Now, it's man not specifically manufacturing related, but it's STEM related and getting students a feel for 
what's a science career look like? What are the activities that scientists and engineers do? Uh, and it's been very successful in getting students engaged in science. And it reaches out into multiple counties with uh, North Alabama and Southern Tennessee, as well as uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and El Paso, Texas, uh, that are reaching out and understanding and working as a team. And they have to come to or present on Skype uh, to a panel here at, at UAH at the end of the semester uh, that evaluates their work and they have a big competition as part of it. And that begins to get students that um, vision for what possibilities there are out there. And it's, it's encouraging uh, female underrepresented uh, students to participate as well and give them leadership opportunities as part of that activity. And we found it to be very successful. We're running anywhere from three to 400 students a year through through Inspires, uh, and it's it's a great experience. I really enjoyed participating in it uh, in my time at UAH. Okay, so I'll ask a question. My son's a recent graduate from an international program in U in uh, United Kingdom, as an engineering program. He's concerned about the expansion of the number of jobs titled engineer when it's not really engineer, and the number of engineers coming out of Russia, India, China, things like that, diluting his value. Can you all comment on that kind of thing? Oh, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what he wants to do. Um, it, you know, if it dilutes his value, he's got to be really interested in what he wants to achieve. That's true with anything. Your job's only as good as your immediate boss. I liked working for Dale. I might say more about me than him, but the, the context is if he's worried about his value, then he needs to think about what is he applying his trade for? What's he wanting to do? And he should be able to compete head to head. If you really like what you're doing, you're gonna do okay. Um, and not all engineers are equal. I'm an imaginary engineer. I did industrial engineering, right? <laughs> we did a little bit of civil, a little bit of mechanical. <laughs> but weren't the hard ones, but we saw the business side of how you tie it all together. It's more of a systems process. And that, pro, you know, that skill set is needed as well. So it really depends on what they want to do and how they want to, what's their craft. That's. Anything else? Mr. White? Well, um, unless there's any more, anything else? Going once, going twice? Okay. Well, uh, big round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>